Building blocks is about the ways in which political parties divide people in their struggle for power and in their struggle to remake the social order. And that's very different from other books on political parties. Um, most um, sociologists um, assume that social divisions on the ground, um, people's uh, religious groups, um, uh, their unions, um, the churches that they belong to, the ethnic associations they belong to, and so forth, um, essentially exert upward pressure on the political system to represent them. Okay, so the assumption is that political parties represent the people uh, in their many um, shades and colors. And, um, and that doesn't really leave a lot of autonomy for political parties. Political parties are basically a reflection of what's going on in society. And we argue that that's, um, you know, a pretty naive point of view uh, because political parties are also interested in actually politicizing certain differences um, like religion, uh, like racial differences and so forth as they struggle to put together an enduring majority. Um, there are other um, books on political parties which suggest that parties merely reflect the interests and ambitions of politicians, uh, individual politicians, or of the government. And um, we argue that political parties are actually quite independent um, uh, from the government. They have their own vision, uh, their own motives, their own uh, objectives, which actually impact uh, and shape the behavior of politicians, individual politicians, and the government. So I guess, you know, building blocks is really about arguing for the independence and power of political parties, and also cautioning people um, that uh, political parties really have this kind of power. The, the different chapters in the book reflect um, uh, mine and my um, collaborators' expertise in a variety of different countries uh, that I think will have a uh, wide appeal to an international audience. Um, there's one chapter um, on Canadian politics and specifically about um, the founding of, um, of the, uh, the CCF, which is now the NDP, it's the Socialist Party um, in Canada, um, by Barry Eidlin, um, who is going to be a professor of sociology at McGill University. Uh, there's my chapter about the ways in which um, working class identity um, have formed in, in the U.S. context in relation to uh, partisan conflict, right? A lot of people um, assume that workers form their identity kind of like whole cloth because of, because of what's going on in the workplace, um, typically. And um, what I argue is that working class identity is shaped in relation to political parties um, as well because political parties are trying to recruit them. Um, um, the third uh, chapter is um, by my co-editor, Jihan Tugel. It's a fascinating chapter. It's on political Islam, or otherwise known as Islamism. And he talks about the ways in which, um, in which Islamism was able to succeed in Turkey, uh, but fail in, in, in Egypt. Um, uh, and of course, you know, the. The failure of the Muslim Brotherhood is, is famous, and, uh, and, and now we have, once again, a military dictatorship after the, that dictatorship was overthrown uh, just a few years ago. Um, the uh, fourth chapter uh, is a really interesting chapter by a political scientist named Dan Slater, and it's on Indonesian politics. And what he finds is that basically in the, in, in the 21st century, uh, political parties have essentially abandoned any attempt at all to kind of mobilize um, the people, um, according to social groups, uh, they've, they've actually, you know, we're, I, I said that at the beginning that political parties divide people in their struggle for power, and what he talks about is, you know, what happens when political parties fail to do that, right? 
Um, and what happens, what ha what's happening now in Indonesia is um, that the political parties are just basically colluding together, you know, with each election and deciding who's going to be president now. I'll, I'll, I'll be president now. What about you next time? Yeah, two years from now, you'd be president. You know what I mean? It's a great, it's a great uh, chapter. Um, he calls he calls it promiscuous power sharing. Um, and then there is a there is a, a, a fifth chapter by my co-editor Manali Desai, who says that basically the the weak kind of economic development agenda in India is tied to the fact that the political parties um, um, have um, um, have uh, a weakness in the way that. Um, they mobilize um, the electorate. In other words, if they were if, if they were able to um, to uh, mobilize a strong, enduring majority, um, uh, organized around the promise of economic development, you would see more robust economic development, right? Uh, and he and she finds that uh, that 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 there is no such political agenda, and so the result, not surprisingly, is that there is weak development um, uh, in India. And the final chapter is by um, a sociologist at Berkeley named Dylan Riley, who basically does a wrap up of um, of all the chapters, does some commentary, which is really nice. I mean, I think that a lot of a lot of edited, edited volumes just sort of like end on a whimper. It's like you know, it's 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 done, goodbye, you know. And and Dylan actually traces us, you know, traces uh, a few themes and arguments uh, through uh, through the volume and says you know something. Um, you know, critical about them, um, uh, congratulatory too, but but also sort of pushing us, and I think that's a really nice way to to end the volume. So those are the chapters. Two of the central themes of uh, the book uh, are centered on social differences and economic conditions. Um, and the reason why that is, is that most scholars suggest that politics are essentially anchored in economic conditions or in social differences, meaning basically political parties respond to economic conditions. They're reactive institutions, right? Or they react, respond, mirror, reflect social differences, right? Um, and uh, what we argue in the book is that political parties are not that passive, okay? So let's take social differences, for example. Um, you know, it, it's true that folks have different religious traditions. Some folks are Jews, some people are Catholic, some people are Muslim, um, others pe other people are Buddhist, um, Hindu, etc. Right, that that's true. We're not saying that that those differences don't exist or somehow they're they're fictional. Um, but whether they matter as a political identity depends on whether or not a political party says that they are a matter of contention. So I'll give you an example from India. Right. Um, Ever since independence, the majority of Indians have been Hindu. There is a small minority of Christians and also of Muslims. Um, but it's only actually fairly recently that a political party based on Hindu nationalism has emerged and become a dominant uh, political force. Right? One might assume that because a majority of Indians have been Hindu uh, for generations that a party such as that would have emerged a long time ago if in fact religion okay or society determines the shape and trajectory of party politics in a given community right and that's simply not the case what the BJP which is a nativist party in, uh, in in India has done is essentially politicized Hindu identity and said that Hindus are being victimized by a whole host of different characters, right, including their opposition Congress Party, right, um, by Muslims, by basically anybody else who's not Hindu, okay, and in this way are are able to um, build a coalition of Hindus who seem to be angry uh, about being victimized by somebody anyway. Yeah, so to really understand what is happening 
um, in uh, India, you have to understand that the BJP is actively trying to um, incite resentment, okay, in order to capture votes, right? And also, by the way, in order to build a new social order, because the BJP is, um, is a neoliberal political party, right? They're a free market fundamentalist party, okay? And the way that they're able to build mass consent for this agenda, which harms a whole lot of people, particularly the poor, is they use Hindu nationalism or Hindu identity, right, um, to, uh, to build support. Um, so, so that's a case in which social divisions don't determine the shape of the political party or the content of, 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 the, of political messaging, but rather the reverse, right? That the BJP, okay, is shaping the identity of people on the ground. Uh, now, as for economic conditions, again, you know, it's sort of, it would be silly for anybody, least of all a sociologist, to say that economic conditions don't matter. Of course they matter. But how they matter is shaped by political parties, right? In uh, the Great Recession in this country, uh, Republicans were insisting that the recession happened uh, as a, a result of too much social spending, okay? Uh, Democrats charged that the Great Recession happened as a result of too little social spending. Republicans said there was too much regulation. Democrats said that there, there was not enough regulation, right? So economic change and economic conditions um, are certainly part of the backdrop. But the thing is, is that economics are continually um, interpreted and contested as political parties vie for power. It's, it's almost um, impossible to separate out economic conditions from all of the political spin that happens to actually interpret those economic conditions uh, um, in a way that advantages one party and disadvantages the other, right? So there are social differences, uh, we say, and economic conditions do matter, but how they matter um, and whether they are politicized one way or another depends on whether or not political parties are in the mix um, and interpreting uh, these differences and these, uh, these conditions um, in a certain way. What's important uh, about the book is um, highlighting this very insidious power that political parties have. You know, we all walk around, we think we're decent people, and we have our political identities, and we say, you know, I'm working class, or I'm a person of color, you know, uh, or I'm LGBT, or I'm a woman, and therefore I vote that way, and I support that political party, and you think that these are your own thoughts, right? That they arose spontaneously from your own autonomous understanding uh, of your interests, um, of what you want for your family, of what you want for your neighborhood and your community. But what we um, want to say is that political parties are at least partly responsible for shaping those identities and those beliefs. And at times, those identities and beliefs can run counter to, um, a, to the needs of uh, a democratic society, right? So for example, a political party that, um, that stokes um, you know, resentment at, um, at certain uh, social groups, um, like the LGBT community, or uh, against uh, immigrants, right? Uh, even in this country, which is a nation of immigrants, right? Um, that is not in any way helpful for, um, for a free society. And I think um, it's important for folks to understand the sheer capacity of political parties to divide people as they struggle for power, because I think that if people really fully comprehend 
what they are up to, then they um, can act in an informed way to shield themselves from that kind of destructive influence. I think at the end of the day, that is the take-home message of the book.